Hi, and welcome to the Parent's Guide for Raising Happy, Healthy, and Resilient Children. I'm your host, Lauren Nickerson, and this is presented in partnership with Beach Cities Health District and South Bay Mommies and Daddies. We have an excellent topic to cover tonight. It's about teaching kindness to our kids at a young age. And in order to talk about this, we had to get the best of the best to come in here and have a discussion with us. Diana Cortez is here. Now, she's a board certified behavior analyst and the founder of South Bay Kids Connection. Thank you so much for being here. We also have Julie Payne, who's a marriage and family therapist and co-owner of the Center for Children's and Families Peninsula. Hi. Hi. Welcome both of you. I'm so happy to have you guys here. I know it's a very big conversation that people are having right now. Kindness, thoughtfulness is a global conversation that we're having as adults. And the question is, can we raise our children to be kinder? Julie, I'm going to start with you. I want to know what age can we start teaching this? Is it right when they come out of the gate? It honestly, it really is. It's never too early to start and it's never too late to start. So earlier, the better. Um, but yeah, no, and no age is too early. Like, I mean, at six months old or three months old, <laughs> is there anything we can do at that point? <laughs> it's, you know what? It's a lot of how our energy is as parents and so much is, you know, everything that we do and how we interact really affects our kids, even in that, you know, first year of life. And so if it's being shown, are they consciously aware of kindness? No, but they definitely pick it up um, just through their environment. And Diana, what do you think about that? At what point do we start just modeling, not only modeling, but maybe mm -hmm. actually implementing some kind of structured teaching of kind behavior? Right. Yes, I completely agree. I think we can start really early. I think the foundational skills of kindness really um, come from, number one, feeling secure. So it's um, modeling that um, you know, security and being okay with ourselves and feeling good about ourselves, um, you know, fostering that in your young child. And then also really from a young age, having your child be aware of other children's feelings and their preferences. It doesn't mean that they have to, you know, it doesn't mean that their needs are more important than your child's needs and your child should know that. But the earlier that they can be aware of that, the better. So you could say things like, oh, you know, look at um, so-and-so, you know, I wonder how they're feeling or, oh, look, he has, you know, blue shoes like you. And just be aware that that other person has their own set of feelings. And that's really the start of kindness is, is putting your, recognizing that there's other children slash people out there that also deserved, um, you know, compassion to feel good as well. That's so funny that you're saying it for kids, but really that's relevant for most adults, if not I all that. adults. <laughs> I hear that though, especially, in, I kind of want to circle back to what you just said about feeling safe, because that is such a great point. I think people and children are at their best when they feel confident, when they feel loved, mm -hmm. when they feel safe, and maybe their kindness or lack thereof comes of a situation where they don't feel safe and loved and comfortable. How can we create that safe feeling for them, especially in a time like now? The best thing that we can do is to be clear, to make things, children feel safe and secure and confident when they understand expectations, when they know what to expect. You know, you have, it's important not to be too rigid, but have some, you know, flexibility in your schedule and what you do, but to be clear that children know um, what their parents, you know, what their values are according to, you know, each family would be slightly different. Um, but that they feel confident, they know they're not always guessing and they're not confused. When children are really confused, that's usually when they get frustrated and they act out. And then if we're not feeling um, you know, happy with ourselves and we're confused, then it's gonna be really hard for us to extend that to somebody else. That sounds like modeling, modeling, modeling. You know, We're showing mm -hmm. them the behavior, especially at that age. Julie, how can we be more conscious of that, especially when the kids are small and we're all stressed and overwhelmed and all the other things that go into parenting at that time. Yeah, it. I, I will say, first of all, especially when you have new children or young children, as you can hear my dogs in the background, um, 
they, you know, a lot of things come up and it gets really frustrating. And so I, you know, as parents, we have human moments and we make mistakes. And so I think when we do that, we should acknowledge how we could have handled something better. Cause that again is modeling how to handle a situation that maybe we're frustrated in, or I apologize for my dogs in the background. Um, so it, you know, it really is about teaching them good, healthy coping skills for how to show anger and how to show frustration in a kind way. It's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to be mean and hurtful. And so, you know, working with little kids, there's a lot of biting and hitting and expression in undesirable ways because they don't have the skills to show their emotions correctly. So showing that early on really helps facilitate good communication and and just more kindness in their own selves and their interactions with other people. It goes such a long way. Do you think, Diana, do you think that it's important that we start at a particularly young age? Is it easier to teach kindness from the get-go versus doing some kind of behavioral reversal as they get a little bit older? Right. So the, the earlier we do it, the, um, you know, just the earlier we're laying the framework. I, I agree that it's never too late, but it's like anything, you know, it's, it's a behavior. And the more we do something, the more opportunities we have as parents to reinforce that, to recognize it, um, you know, to praise that behavior. And, and that way it just becomes a habit. And it's not something that kids, you know, have to always, you know, and then when they get to adults, always think about, you know, it's just something they become kind people, you know, so everything, their acts are naturally kind because they come through a filter of being a kind person. Um, and it just lays the framework, and sorry, the foundation of other life skills that they're gonna need, you know, like compassion and communication. So, and once you get to school, they're gonna have to work in groups. They're gonna have to do that academically. They're gonna have to do that when they get older. So the earlier, the better, because it just becomes more and more embedded into their personality. That's really great advice. I, um, I'm thinking when we go forward into trying to teach our kids kindness starting at a young age, how does that actually practically look or what are some practical things that we can do? Let's say compare it at you know one year versus two years versus five years and beyond, um, Julie. So one of the things um, that I did with my own kids, and then I do it a lot with new moms or moms with very young children, is when they have um, kind of responses that aren't the best, maybe they're hitting or things like that, teaching them alternative ways to show their um, feelings without being hurtful um, and acknowledging as parents that they're people, they're little people, and they have big emotions. And so really kind of giving them some attention and acknowledgement of that. I think, you know, especially for this last year with the pandemic, we've put so much on our kids through this. It's life is not normal. Um, and so really just helping them adjust. They are very resilient. Um, but it, it helps to have those discussions very early on. And for little ones, there's a lot of great cartoons that teach some of these skills and have good moments that parents can speak to their kids about and, and have discussions of how they may handle a situation with a friend or a sibling. Um, so there's a lot of ways that the little ones can get it without having to really just sit down and talk to them like they are older or teens. Right. Do you think it's important to use certain verbiage like be nice or be kind, or maybe there's a better way to say that? I hear a lot of parents saying like, that's not nice. Be kind, be nice. But if they don't really understand what that means, that may be a little harder for them to course correct on. So Diana, what do you think we can say to them in those times when they're toddlers, for example, that will help them understand the concept of what being nice means? Right. It's so abstract. Be nice. Yes. Okay. Be nice. Be better. <laughs> I don't know. If I would if I would is that. So be specific is what I would say to parents. So whatever it is in that moment that you would like to see, be specific and be um, reasonable and help them if they need it. So if they need to share or take a turn or um, 
give up something for whatever reason, you know, help them along, show them that it's easy and then praise them for it. Um, so they're rewarded because we want the kids to feel good about it. And we want them to associate being kind to others. Oh, this is, this brings me a good feeling. So this is good for me too. So I would just say be very specific and intentional um, of what you're doing and don't be afraid to give like little prompts and, you know, little hints to them as well to guide them in what you want to see. Dana, can you just talk me through that a little bit further? Like, uh, for example, say that your two-year-old goes over at preschool and grabs a toy out of another kid's hand. How would mm -hmm. you specifically correct that in a, in a way that teaches kindness and feeling good? Yeah, well, first I would, um, if that other child was still there um, and they were upset, I would most likely, you know, have my, that my child look at the other child too and see the impact on their, you don't have to belabor the point, but like, oh, you know, he's sad, recognize that emotion of the other kid. This is what we can do. Um, you can ask him, you know, depending on what you want that child to see. So, you, oh, you can ask him, can I have, can I have this uh, for another minute? Or, um, you know, let's give it back. Let's try that. Let's try that again. Can, can I borrow that? Or um, whatever you want them to say, you can even just say the words and have that your child repeat the words verbatim, just model the language for them. And then again, like praise them for it. That's great advice. Uh, Julie, what do you think that kindness might look like in children and maybe in certain ways that we don't normally recognize it? I think a lot of it is in how they speak with each other. I think kids in an, are inherently kind and they see the goodness in other people. Um, and for many reasons, um, you know, that kind of shifts either way, but people are generally kind and generous and compassionate. Um, so I think they're, uh, they already come pre-programmed that way. Um, and so it's not a lot of work to model kindness for them. Um, and it, it really is just, you know, very kind of simple ways to show better interactions. If they make a mistake or if they didn't think things through, kids tend to be impulsive and they think about themselves a lot of things they want and toys and stuff like that. Um, so if there's a, a time where you're going to the park or you're going to play, um, you know, having a discussion with your kid ahead of time of, okay, when we're going to the park, do you want to try to make new friends? How can we do that? What are things we can say to somebody else? Do you want to bring toys that you can share? So having conversations and kind of getting their involvement in their own interactions with other kids, I think can be really helpful. Is there any value in rewarding sort of after the fact or, for example, saying that you come home from a play date and then you say, I noticed that you shared these toys really nicely and I want to give you a reward for that by, you know, taking you to the ice cream store on the way home. Or I noticed that you and your brother got along really well today and that was so kind of you to look. I mean, just, do those things actually work? <laughs> Diana, what do you think? Yes, they do work. <laughs> they do work and they can work. And it really just depends. I know there's it can be a hot button issue like uh, external rewards. But um, I would say if that's something that's, um, it kind of depends on the situation. So definitely rec the acknowledgement 100% every time. Like, that's great. Wow, I really, I noticed this. I noticed that. And kids just want that recognition. Um, and let's give it to them. Let's, this, that's great. Now, as far as like adding on like a trip to the ice cream shop, maybe, maybe not every single time, you know, that's a, that's a whole other thing. Also, like it depends on if they're struggling or, or not. Um, because if your child specifically is like really having a hard time and, you know, you have to give them like so many prompts and it's just, just really, really difficult for them, that might be a great way to add an extra, you know, motivation for them to give them an um, external reward, and then you can kind of fade that reward um, as time goes on. Um, but then once they get used to it and it's not a big deal, then you would want to pare that down because you wouldn't want such a huge reward for something that should be sort of commonplace. But it depends on where the child is in that skill because it can be a skill for a lot of kids. That's such a great point because I think so many of us parents really struggle with 
what should be expected at what age and then mm -hmm. what should we reward if you set up too much of a reward system and then all of a sudden they won't do anything they're supposed to do without a reward or a consequence maybe if you have that but it's i think every parent goes through that i know i have you know struggles with that as well trying to figure out the best way to like normalize the kind of behavior that i want them to have and i i'm curious julie if you have any tricks or tips on that especially as it pertains to like rewarding and encouraging kindness in little kids yeah um so i'm not i'm not opposed to external rewards at all but where it gets tricky is um we don't want it to be so much to the point where they only do it to get the reward because um, we we want them to be rewarded with their kindness for their feeling good that they get from being kind. And so kind of showing that that piece of, of doing things for other people just because it feels good and it's nice to give back, not to necessarily get something. Um, and I think, you know, having conversations where we're focusing a lot on like little kids. Um, and I had a, a moment with my kids. I've done this for a long time where I will we'll pay something forward and like a drive through. I'll pay for the person behind me. And the kids have been in the car with me and seen me do it and never really registered. And more recently, men are seven and eight and they saw me do it and asked, can we do that? Can you do that anytime? Have you done that before? And it <laughs> sparked this whole conversation of my daughter saying, I want to save up money and I want to be able to do that. Can we go feed the homeless? And it just snowballed into so much that she wanted to do to give back. And it really made me think I should have vocalized more when I did it for them to see it. I was just doing it because it's something my husband and I do. Um, but it was really neat to see that kids do watch what we do. They pick up mm -hmm. on that and want to do it too. Yeah. And we have to be careful as well with the behavior that we might show to somebody who cut us off while we're driving and they're in yep. the back seat let's just say or you know times when you know we do things that we don't even notice that may not be thoughtful or kind or maybe we know part of the story that they don't know which i think can sometimes be hard so it really is like children always hold up a mirror to us with everything we do but i think especially in this case it's really important to kind of take stock in your own behavior over and over again to make sure that those kids are picking up the, the better qualities let's just uh, say of, of uh, who we absolutely. are absolutely you you mentioned about cutting somebody somebody off and our normal response is usually especially in la traffic right like oh what what were they doing um and just changing the language to saying they must really be in a hurry to get to where they need to go we're not in hurry. We can just take our time. It it makes it okay. We're we're in control of the situation, regardless of what other people are doing. And so again, you know, just kind of shifting our language and how we talk to kids, no matter the age, goes a long way. Yeah. Well, and I heard uh, a saying the other day, and I really have had to think about it. How they were talking about some people are nice but not kind, and some people are kind but not nice. And so I'm just kind of chewing that one over a little bit because I think to me what that says is it's not just what you say, it's what you do and mm -hmm. how it's not just what you do, it's how how you present it sometimes too. I mean, Diana, is this something that kids are too little to figure out just yet? Or maybe is that something we should be looking into as well? Yeah, I think if they just get used to the little everyday interactions of kindness, then it just it just becomes second nature. And it can just be something like, um, you know, asking if, if they're at school or if they're, um, you know, once they get back into school, you know, what, what their preferences is. If they're handing out papers, you know, do you want blue or do you want yellow? Getting to know other people's preferences. So if they're just little interactions, I don't think we need to be, I like the shifting of the language for sure, um, but I don't think we need to get too bogged down on it. Just the actions, I definitely think the actions speak louder than words. And we want them to just always, with with the things that they do with others, just have in mind that there's, you know, other people's feelings to get into consideration. Yeah. So what do we do when your child is on the receiving end of unkindness? How do we frame that for them, Julie? That can definitely be a tough one because as parents, we tend to go into kind of protective mode of nobody's going to treat my kid that way. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, 
kind of really removing our own selves from that situation and helping them learn how to express what they're feeling and how to, you know, go back after the fact and address the situation. If there was, you know, a kid that they were interacting with that wasn't very kind and that somebody they see regularly, maybe at preschool or something, going back and saying, you know, yesterday I didn't like it when you took my toy, but, and being able to speak up and say something and letting the the child kind of have some say in how a situation is handled and guide them through it, I think can be beneficial. That's a great point. That's very hard for kids and adults to do though. How do we, uh, Diana, and I'm gonna throw this one at you, how do we actually put that into practicality? And then what happens if the shoe is on the other foot, say that your kid is suddenly the bully or the mean one. Mm -hmm. Right, I think um, teaching assert assertiveness is really, really important. So if you do notice, um, starting first if your child is on the receiving end, that someone is being unkind to them, a lot of times kids will freeze up because they're not necessarily used to it or they're just, you know, so giving them that language, if they don't have it already and teaching them things that they could say, you know, I don't like that, please stop you know, that's appropriate assertiveness because we want them to know that yes, they need to be kind to others, but they need to be kind to themselves as well. And so sometimes, I mean, I know as a parent too, I, I focus a lot on that. I've had to have discussions with my children, like make sure you're kind to yourself too. Like you are equally as important as others. Um, and I think if your child is the one being unkind, then we need to figure out why, you know, um, we need to examine what, under what circumstances that they're acting this way, um, any patterns of behavior that are sort of leading up to it. Is it, you know, when they're hungry, is it a certain peer? Is it a certain environment? Um, you know, sometimes we just need to set up like, certain rules. I know, for example, if you have like play dates, sometimes kids can become very territorial of their toys or of their environment. Um, so we might want to think of like, okay, this, my child really to be successful needs to be in a different environment, or um, we need to put these toys up on the shelf because these aren't toys that, you know, they're comfortable sharing. So basically figuring out why they're doing that. And in order to figure out why, we really need to just look at behavioral patterns. Mm, okay. Well, on the behavioral patterns idea, uh, this one's actually for both of you and Julie, I'll start with you. But as parents, I know it's really hard for us to know, especially first time parents, what is sort of normal developmental behavior and what is a red flag. So I guess my question to both of you is, what do you see as sort of the parameters of kids just being kids, un unkind, mean, nasty, blunt, whatever it is that they are? What, when do we look at that and go, okay, wait a minute, this is a red flag. We've got a real problem here that needs to go a step further in addressing. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in there. I think there is a lot of, you know, normal behavior that kids are learning and kind of exploring and acting out. And some aren't very desirable. I think if it happens regularly, if it's a one-time event, you know, it's a conversation. If it happens again, you know, a month later, a couple weeks later, conversation. But if it's something that's every day or it's really interfering in the home life of the family or the child, I think it warrants at least a discussion with somebody else to see if there's some ideas that can be implemented to make things a little bit easier. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. I would say when it gets to the point um, because, you know, they're still exploring and, and, and not under, you know, how they learn is by sort of breaking the boundaries of certain things and they, okay, this is not acceptable. This is, but when your child is having like sustained issues, um, making some positive social relationships, um, especially around, you know, the age when they are, you know, that preschool age, then I think it is time to consult the school, consult, you know, possibly a professional. Um, also, again, like look at, you know, this is my profession, but looking at the behavioral patterns, like why is this happening? Under what circumstances um, is this behavior happening? But it, it's it's okay, um, you know, to, to do these things and to act out and that's how we learn. But if we don't want to um, have a, such an ingrained pattern that then it becomes a learned behavior. And then that child, for example, if they're acting out at school, 
And then when they go to school, they sort of have that connection of, oh, I'm at school, it's recess, this is what I do, because I've just made this, you know, connection, we can just learn behavior. Um, so we want to consult, and there's so many great resources um, at schools, um, particularly, and outside as well, that uh, kids can get a lot of help these days, um, and, and we can really tackle this collaboratively. So we're in this unprecedented time where our kids are home, they're on devices all the time, and they have no social interaction. So especially for little kids who are sort of supposed to be stepping into the bigger world right now and bouncing off all those other kids, uh, what is kind, what isn't, what's acceptable and what's not, is there anything that we can do at home to help them out, Diana? Well, it is, it is tricky and it is unfortunate that, um, you know, they don't have as much practice as they would have if they were, you know, under normal circumstances. But even just very simple things at home, like playing a little game with a sibling or a parent, um, just the act of taking turns and saying like, hey, can I go first? Or, um, hey, why don't you go first? Or what color do you want to be? Again, those things are making... Um, sure that we're aware that other people have preferences and maybe I want to be blue this time. You were blue last time. Um, also, when you finish the game, make sure you say, hey, good game. You can give a high five. You can um, say, hey, I had fun, something like that. Just really simple little things that show that you're aware of other people's feelings and that you're enjoying their company. It goes a long way. And that's really, really good practice. Little games at home go a long, long way. And the same thing with like crafts that you do. Um, one thing that we do in group a lot um, when we're under normal circumstances is we make things for each other instead of always for ourselves. So if we're doing like a craft, um, I'll pair them up and they have to, in order to make something that their partner would like, they have to ask that partner, what color do you want? Um, you know, what uh, kind of sequence do you want? Do you want pom-poms? Do you not? <laughs> so just little things um, like knowing what other people like and trying to make um, purposeful little gestures like that really, really go a long way. That's a, such a great thing to think about. And I, I'm thinking too about gifts and things that we make for each other and, and what that means, you know, to kindness, that uh, effort of thinking about somebody else and thinking about what they may need. Uh, Julie, do you have any additional tips or ideas for when our kids are at home kind of not being out in the world? Yeah, it, you know, without having those interactions, and I do feel so bad for our kids right now because they're missing so much of that social emotional support that they they need. There's so much growth that happens on those early years. Um, and COVID has definitely put a little damper in that. Um, you know, there's things around the neighborhoods that you can do. Um, in, in our neighborhood, we were doing rock paintings and leaving them on the green belt so people could find them. Um, and it just brightens somebody's day. People will take them and kind of swap um, or delivering food to a neighbor or even, you know, kind of just working with what you have with the limited resources of COVID. Um, and then preparing them for when they are back in school of what it's going to be like um, and trying to get some interactions. If there's no siblings at home, you know, the parent interactions and playing games, I think, is excellent. There's also lots of ways that kids can play games virtually now, too. Um, so that's been a, a big benefit with COVID. Yeah, well, and I think I speak for myself and I'm guessing for several other people out there. Uh, my social skills are shot after a year of being home. And if I even see someone from, you know, 15 feet away walking the dog, I'm like, hey, I, how, how I? I don't know what to say anymore. So I'm, I'm only imagining that our kids will deal with that times 50 when they go back to whatever version of school they may go back to or at whenever we're able to safely visit people again. Uh, how can we sort of hold their hand and guide them into those interactions, Diana? Right. Um, I think preparing them and letting them know sort of what to expect, not to overwhelm them, but just to let them know, you know, again, because when they do go back, it's going to look differently. So being clear so that they're as confused as, you know, as little as possible. Um, and also letting that, you know, if 
however they feel about it, it's okay. You know, it's okay. However they feel about it. Um, and listening to them because that's what we want them to do. That's also a huge part of kindness is just listening to the other person. And we need to model that for our kids as well. So just being there for them, um, regardless of how it goes. Julie, what do you think? I absolutely agree. I, for our little ones, I think they'll have a much easier time going back. I think for our older ones and adults too, it's there's so much <laughs> awkwardness now of, because there's been so limited interactions. I personally think all the little ones are just going to be so excited to see a friend or to see other kids that hmm. I think they'll naturally fall right back into it. <laughs> I'm really interested to see what happens too with the older kids, you know, in middle school or high school, because we all sort of know these stereotypes of what those social interactions are like. And we're all prepared for them. We all live through them as a rite of passage that kids can be really hard on each other at that age. But I'm curious to see if that might change, you know, as we go back, if everyone's just so grateful to have each other again, that all of the shaming and bullying and criticizing each other might ease back at least for a little while. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yes. <laughs> it, it would be. Yeah. Yeah, definitely would. Um, and just kind of on that same topic of all of us being home, should we be giving a little extra grace here to our kids and maybe to ourselves as well? If we aren't doing all of those things. I know there's all these great ideas and we all want to be kind and lovely and wonderful, but there are days where I know we all feel not our best self and our kids especially. So, you know, how do we how do we temper that, Diana, with trying to raise great kids, but also give them the freedom to feel yucky and nasty and mean yeah. a little bit? Yeah, it's I've, I've definitely um, had, you know, this conversation in my head and with my husband many times about my own kids. Um, I think, yes, tons of grace, tons and tons, because, I mean, we're all struggling and our kids, especially those older kids. Um, I have one that's a freshman or, you know, in high school. Um, and it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, everything about it, the instruction online, cameras on, cameras off. There's all these tiny little things that are, are really hard. Um, and I just always go back to the number one priority is the mental health of, of the child. And so if that means like, hey, let them, the homework's overwhelming or, you know, slacking off here or there. Okay, but are we well-rounded? Are we still, you know, being a decent human being and, you know, um, you know, upholding the values of the family, but still the mental health is stable and we're relatively happy. And for them to know that, there's a broad spectrum of feelings and they're all okay. And it's okay to be happy. It's okay to be sad. And I also think like just empathizing with that, like, yeah, I get it. And not trying to solve it. And just you know, like, I feel that way too, you know, sometimes and just keeping it really real with them, I think goes a really, really long way. Julie, do you think that the family dynamic has shifted in some ways since we've all been home together, feeling so many big feelings together is there have you noticed maybe with people that you work with that they're changing the dynamic of the family maybe even for the better yeah i m my biggest hope as bad as this pandemic's been is that this is going to kind of spark a lot of changes um and there really has been a lot of focus on social emotional health and development um and you know everybody through this pandemic has their own unique situation. There are parents that are working, there's single parents, there's parents that have been home with little kids, there's people who have been by themselves completely with no family in the house. And so I think, you know, kind of acknowledging that, that we are all doing the best we can and we do get frustrated. We're all, you know, as parents doing our own things and jobs, whatever we have on our plate and trying to handle the kids stuff and the expectations of their education and it really, you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of mental health days and taking time off for ourselves and for kids as well. And knowing that when they feel like it's too much and they need a break, that it's okay to take a break. It's okay mm -hmm. to not do the homework. It's not always not do the homework, but sometimes <laughs> you need that break and that kind of grace and allowance that it's okay to take time for yourself. Yeah. That's really, it's a great way to look at it. And of course, 
adding on to all of that, there are so many families that are affected by COVID in their home. So now you're dealing with, you know, sick or passing of loved ones, family, you know, it's, it's not an easy time for everybody, especially when it comes to mental health and their feelings. So I think all of that advice is really great uh, ways to sort of look for, you know, the, the sunny side, but also acknowledge that it isn't sunny all the time. And maybe we together can, as a family, you know, express the way that we feel in a, a place that's safe. So I think that's, that's really fantastic advice. Um, as we start to wrap up the show, I always like to ask people, you know, if you could give parents out there right now listening, maybe two pieces of really practical advice to help teach their kids kindness and to take that forward, what would those two pieces of advice be? And I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Diana. Um, I would say I, I really think it's powerful to ask a lot of open-ended questions to get um, to kind of pique child's uh, interest. And so a lot of like, hmm, I wonder how this one's feeling, or I wonder what they think of whatever. Because you want them to formulate their own opinions and um, and really spark their curiosity. And then I would um, just model lots and lots of little things that they can do, um, whether it be, you know, again, like, oh, you can go first in line or just talking about something that you did or that you saw um, somebody do that was kind. Good advice. I like that. Uh, what about you, Julie? Um, I think, you know, getting those conversations going, knowing that we aren't perfect and we will make mistakes and so will kids. But I think, at, you know, especially as kids go back to the classroom, we always, as parents, ask, you know, how your day was. And eventually we get the, oh, fine, or it was okay. But you can start asking, you know, what, how did somebody show you kindness today? How did you show somebody else kindness today? And really get them to start looking at those times where they're experiencing kindness from other people and then where they're giving it. And they naturally start to kind of look at life through that lens. Hmm. I think we can all use to look through life a little bit through that lens right now. That is such great advice. I think both of you have just given so many valuable points tonight, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about the subject. It's so important to all of us to raise uh, the next generation of kids who are thoughtful and who are kind. Uh, Diana Cortez, uh, you can find her founder of South Bay Kids Connection. Thank you so much for being here. Julie Payne, uh, marriage and family therapist, co-owner of the Center for Children and Families Peninsula. Thank you for taking the time. You guys are both really great. Uh, I just wanna encourage everyone that's watching, if you wanna learn more about the Beach Cities Health District, you can visit their website, bchd.org. Make sure you follow South Bay Mommies and Daddies on all the social media. And if you are in South Bay and you are a mommy or a daddy, you might want to join the Facebook group so that you can talk with fellow moms and dads about local stuff. I want to thank you so much, all of you for joining us and stay safe out there. Have a good one.